So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the third webinar in our series on cyber warfare and terrorism, a short course presented by IT Masters on behalf of Charles Sturt University. My name is Guy Coward and I'm your MC today and Richard of course is your mentor and we're talking on terrorism specifically today. As usual we've got Diane working on chat and thank you for her for joining thank you to her for joining us. Uh, just a quick one from me today. We've got no guest speakers, which we can just power through, which is nice. Um, but yeah, just a quick word on Zoom functions. You can ask us questions uh, using the Q&A function in, in Zoom, or you can chat amongst yourselves or, or ask sort of admin questions to Diane and myself in the, in the chat function. You can find both of those in the bottom of the Zoom window to so the options for those. And just a reminder to, to set your uh, chat receivers to all panelists and attendees so that everyone is kept in the loop. Um, other than that, not much to say for me today, mercifully. So <laughs> we'll say good day to Richard Steenen, who, who's uh, from the looks of it, got a cat in the background. <laughs> yeah, can you hear that, can you? <laughs> oh, no, just the very faintest of things, and it's not a problem. We're, we're, uh, we're an inclusive group here, and cats are included. But good, everyone, well, well, welcome, to Richard. Uh, thanks, Guy. Yeah, if I put the cat in the bathroom, it would be even louder. So we just have to deal with it. <laughs> yep. So like it. welcome, everybody. Um, as you know, the you know the title of the short course is Cyber Warfare and ter Terrorism. So this is the terrorism section. Um, and, and of course, uh, we're going to focus on cyber terrorism uh, because you would need an entire course to deal with terrorism. Um, this is the third of four sessions. Uh, as a reminder, we talked about cyber weapons and the methods of cyber warfare in the first module. Uh, and then we talked about the rise of the state we have today of these influence ops going on. Uh, and tonight we're talking about cyber terrorism. So just like my other sessions, uh, we better set some definitions. Um, NATO has a definition for cyber terrorism as a cyber attack using or exploiting computer or communication networks to cause sufficient destruction or disruption to generate fear or to intimidate a society into an ideological goal. Uh, a lot of issues with that. Um, or you could be, uh, it could be as general as it could be any cyber attack intended to purely cause disruption. Of course, the trouble with that is, you know, a, a lone actor who isn't associated with a cyber terrorist group is just, uh, you know, me getting mad at um, my grocery store, taking down their website, probably not terrorism. Or anonymous uh, taking on uh, banks, also probably not terrorism. But a definition that you could possibly use is that we should just talk about cyber attacks by terrorists. And then we've got a definition of terrorism. Terrorism or cyber terrorism is cyber attacks by terrorists, which leaves us with what is a terrorist? Um, which of course, I'm sure we get into a lot of questions about. Uh, luckily we have some uh, designations of terrorist groups from the US State Department. Uh, since about 1997, the State Department has designated 61 separate groups as terrorist organizations. It includes uh, familiar names like Hamas and Hezbollah, and of course ISIL. Um, uh, things you may not have followed as much as Al Shabaab, um, Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, the Tariki Taliban, Pakistan. Uh, of course, if you're in these areas, you know all about these. <laughs> Uh, Boko Haram in Africa, and then now ISIL, ISIL has uh, moved into the Sinai province as well. Um, and then we've got a separate branch of ISIL in Libya. And on the cyber front, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, ISIL and their supporting um, jihadist cyber actors. Not sure if all their activity can be classified as cyber terrorism, but they're in support of terrorist organizations. I want to make the point that a lot of the use of media by terrorists and 
frankly, insurgents and guerrillas and warfare um, is all about garnering media attention. Um, and if, you know, if everybody could chime in, I'd say, <clears throat> do you recognize the picture of this hotel? And I'd wait while everybody guessed. But since you're not chiming in, I get to tell you that this is the Europa Hotel in downtown Belfast. Um, the time I, I stayed there, uh, somebody, you know, I don't know if they proudly told me, this is the most bombed hotel in the world. And the reason it was the most bombed hotel in the world is that this is where all the journalists stayed who were covering the troubles, as everybody in the UK euphemistically calls, um, you know, whatever it was, the terrorists of the IRA, the Civil War, uh, however you want to define what was happening in Ireland, um, the, the uh, IRA knew that they'd get the most media attention if they bombed the hotel that the media was in. Uh, so it's kind of sets the stage for some of the things that we see going on today uh, with uh, internet types of attacks. So keep that in mind. So uh, let's first review the early history of, of cyber terrorism. Um, in, in the suggested reading, I think maybe even in the required reading, is a uh, article written by Dorothy Deming. Um, who did a really great job of this early history, and she wrote it before modern history, so it was you know sometime in the early 2000s. Uh, so it could look back and pick up on things that we might not consider very terroristic <laughs> or cyber influential today. Um, but she cites the very first uh, incident that could be classified as cyber terrorism, uh, and that was in 1998 in Sri Lanka. And the Tamil guerrillas um, had a, a group called the Internet Black Tigers, and they mail bombed Sri Lankan embassies around the world. And basically, basically, they were sending only 800 emails an hour. But back in 1998, when everybody had an email server, you know, in their offices, um, it, you can make one fall over and, and reboot and stop responding to emails, fill up the mail queues, uh, fill up the hard drives. Um, I remember uh, I used to respond to spammers back in the day when spammers were, were people sending you unsolicited email. So you'd just take, you know, half your hard drive and bundle it up in a zip file and you'd email it back to them. And for them to receive it, you'd use up all their bandwidth for hours at a time. And these were so-called mail bombs. Um, Getting back to the IRA, they employed the services of contract hackers to penetrate computers in order to acquire the home addresses of British law enforcement and intelligence officers. They were going to initiate an attack called the Night of the Long Knives. They're going to kill a lot of British law enforcement and intelligence officers at once. Um, thankfully, they didn't follow, carry through on that. Um, but this is an example of terrorists using the internet and hackers in order to gain intelligence and obviously intelligence for targets, which is one of the primary uses of intelligence in the military world. Uh, and then we had the case of uh, Khalid Ibrahim, who claimed to be a member of the militant Indian separatist group uh, who tried to buy military software from hackers who had stolen it from the U.S. Department of Defense that they claimed that they had penetrated. Uh, that was kind of close to home. It was here in Detroit uh, that all this went on, and he was prosecuted for that, and the hackers were, you know, questioned. And they say they stole the stuff, but they never gave it to the person representing the terrorist or organization. Uh, and then I've also included in the suggested reading a statement to a U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee on Technology, Terrorism, and Governments, um, and back, so this is back in February of 1998, and it was believed that members of some Islamic extremist organizations have been attempting to develop a hacker network to support their computer activities and even engage in offensive information warfare attacks in the future. So this is uh, going on uh, 19 years ago that the pundits, I guess, and researchers were identifying a threat from uh, from terrorist organizations. I'm just going to 
you know, kind of lead in to my final question is because, you know, we really don't see, you know, strong hacker networks. We don't see offensive information warfare attacks uh, of the type that people have been envis envisioning for a long time. Um, so there's a citation for Dorothy Deming's uh, article, The Logic Bomb versus the Truck Bomb. And I've included a link to that in the reading. So let's drill into this uh, uh, Islamic State and the hacker organizations associated with them. It's, it's muddy waters. The Islamic State doesn't necessarily uh, uh, sanction these hacker groups by name. So we don't know if they're just uh, independent actors who are inspired by the caliphate and ISIL and are supporting it, you know, with their uh, our drawer, uh, or if uh, or if they're somehow organized uh, appropriately. And so there's four separate uh, teams that associate themselves with the caliphate: uh, this Ghost Caliphate, Sons Caliphate Army, Cyber Caliphate Army, um, and they had quite a quite a bit of activity um, four or five years ago starting in about 2014. And then in 2016, they announced that they were uniting uh, into one group called the United Cyber Caliphate, uh, which certainly would make things easier for all the intelligence analysts trying to track these people uh, if they truly were uh, in, uh, organized in any way whatsoever. But it's still not evident that they are. So, just after the introduction, that's a great place to stop and uh, ask questions, Guy, if you've seen any coming in yet. Great, yes. Uh, just a quick one from Rich. Uh, ISIS and ISIL, the same group? Yeah, sorry about that. Same group. Yep, yep. Uh, yep. also called Daesh, I think. Yep. Um, I, if I say Daesh, I'll, I'll, I'll upset them. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and the caliphate, same thing, because ISIL declared the caliphate. Okay, uh, I got a question and follow-up question from Ali. Richard, the list from the U.S. State Department you've presented lists only Islamist or Muslim identifying groups. What about others? Surely there must be others. Uh, as uh, a follow and as a follow-up, uh, he asks, "What about state-sponsored?" Um, but I think we'll get into that a little bit later in the in the webinar about state-sponsored groups and the blurry lines between those two. Uh, as he says, yeah. seems a little arbitrary. But yeah, yeah. So so. I'm sorry about that if that happened because in the 67 or so that they listed, there are some that are not um, uh, associated with, uh, you know, Islamic jihadism. Um, but as I went through them, I was picking out names I recognize, and that's probably my fault for seeing, you know, the <clears throat> the media about them. Yeah, and that, that's, that's just it, isn't it? It's about the narratives that we receive as well. Yep. Um, and Try to balance that by talking about the IRA because. Hmm. Yeah, well, there you go. You know, they're not Muslim. Yeah. Uh, and of course, chat is going ballistic. Uh, <laughs> there was an amazing uh, question in there. I think it was from Robert. But um, yeah, it's just gone crazy. He He's asked, uh, uh, who decides if a cyber action is hacktivism or terrorism? Does it require identifying the actor's objective? And knowledge um, both have consequences that can cause death and economic consequences and of course yeah. you know chaos ensues in the chat but um it's, it's an amazing question and and do you have any position or or ideas as to how to make sense of it um i, I it does seem to help to look at the motivations and affiliations um take the uh wacko in las vegas the open fire on the crowd um, a month ago was that? Yeah, right uh, So far, you know, obviously, it, yes, it was as horrible as a, um, you know, car bomb going off. Uh, but was it terrorism or was he just a very disturbed, crazy person, you know, influenced by whatever's going on in the United States right now that makes that seem like an okay thing to do? I don't know. Um, if there were a connection to, um, uh, a terrorist organization, be, we'd be pretty fast to um, call it a terrorist attack. If there is no connection, 
and it's not. Or the bombing of uh, the uh, federal building in Oklahoma in, I think that was 94. Um, you know, that was, you know, just U.S. wacko militia types doing it. Are they terrorists? Were are they organized? What are they trying to accomplish? Um, you know, I guess that probably does fit the definition of terrorism. Uh, and there are certainly uh, identified uh, U.S.-based uh, terrorist organizations over the years. Uh, you know, sometimes they step over the line and their uh, endeavors, you know, to support their green activities. Um, and they've, you know, been bombing and hurting people for a long time. You know, you could easily say the anti-abortion uh, activities uh, and some of those actually did involve uh, cyber attacks. So they'd fall into it too. You can see we're treading in uh, uh, very muddy waters and there are a lot of lines, especially to me, the line between terrorists and uh, uh, insurgents is hard to draw. What do you do? You know, where do you put uh, Lawrence of Arabia? You know, so he's uh, employed by the British military and he's encouraging, uh, you know, uh, essentially militia uh, attacks on railroads and probably much worse things um, that went on then was that pure good old guerrilla warfare as most of the history books treat it um, or you know, was it the uh, beginnings of demonstrating how a small force, uh, you know, fights back against a militarized organization? Yeah, and, 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 and as a comment just came in, were American revolutionaries terrorists? You know, you could go on yeah. forever. You could go on yeah. forever. You? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, does it come down to are they wearing uniforms or not? You know, that's... Yeah, kind of inter international law really does pay a lot of attention to the presence of uniforms. Um, but, you know, it's the Mujahideen in, uh, in uh, Afghanistan weren't wearing uniforms either uh, when the United States backed them so heavily against the Soviet Union. So there's, there's some uh, interesting resources and uh, uh, analysis that's being done. Uh, there's this whole realm of uh, uh, threat intelligence uh, vendors who seek to grab as much data as they can off the open web. And sometimes they dive into the dark web. And you know, Recorded Future is one of them. So they've done some analysis on the cyber caliphate. And this is really their, uh, you know, their activities as reflected by mentions of them on Twitter. So that's just, you know, a very simplistic way to do it, but we've got data. So uh, we had, you know, some early uh, creation of the cyber caliphate in September of 2014. And then by this January to February uh, timeframe, we had the activities, some of which I'll be talking about in a second here, that spiked the, uh, uh, the number of mentions on Twitter. So one view into tracking these types of activities as you know as i was pulling together the slides looking for recent news articles it really seems like in this case the social media companies are starting to to do a good job of not letting their platforms be tools of uh of people propagating these violent uh, ethics so we, uh, harping back to our very first uh, uh, week and when we talked about distributed denial of service, uh, there was a pretty good analysis of uh, a uh, forum on the dark web, uh, supposedly a pro-ISIS uh, forum. Uh, and the, the uh, people in, involved in it started discussing, hey, we got to do something here why don't we create a DDoS tool? So somebody went off and created the Caliphate Cannon. Nobody's actually acquired a copy of the Caliphate Cannon to analyze it, uh, but they have seen the attacks that it issues. So it sounds like it's a very simple, downloadable piece of software that would run from your desktop uh, and then allows you to uh, you know, put in a website or an IP address, and it would use HTTP GET commands. So this is very simple. This is just like re refreshing your web browser uh, against a particular page uh, on a website. 
And if you do it right, you pick the page that, that takes the most computer resources to deliver and you just keep requesting it. So you just set up a little tool with a script that does that. One interesting thing is that uh, to hide the source, you know, whoever's you know, using their laptop uh, somewhere in their apartment to, uh, to protect them from being traced back, all of the attacks went over Tor. So Tor, of course, is this uh, onion uh, uh, routing network that uh, uh, does fairly effective job of anonymizing source IP addresses. I could talk for an hour about Tor and some of the issues associated with it. Um, and I had to, since I believe about half the, the people enrolled in the class are uh, actually in Australia, there's a good example of um, the uh, Islamic State, the cyber caliphate, uh, taking down the uh, airport website for Hobart. And, you know, this was viewed as a terrorist attack. Uh, it, it, it didn't really uh, disrupt the airport that much, but the website was down. So people paid attention to it. This is way back in the innocent days of April 2015. So it was newsworthy at the time. Now, another one that was a little more chilling was that ISIS accumulated a list of 8,000 citizens, uh, U.S. citizens primarily, and uh, in the military and law enforcement, and released this as a kill list uh, and included the names of several Hollywood celebrities, uh, some people we all know, and in the hopes that uh, recruits who were lone wolf uh, jihadists would, you know, attack and kill the people on this list. Um, now, originally, the news was reported that they had hacked this list somehow from the Defense Department, um, but it turns out that uh, the FBI claims that the list was just compiled from publicly available information and put together. But either way, they're, start, they're starting to use the, uh, you know, the, the media in such a way to generate this fear, because obviously it's going to generate fear. They're using the media to um, uh, magnify their impact. You know, it's just like if somebody tries to create a viral video, then you just hope that the media picks up on it. And the one that had the, uh, the cyber attack that had the most impact uh, and got the most attention was the uh, defacement of TV5 Mon's, Mon's uh, 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 website and Facebook page. And basically, hackers got in, supposedly the cyber caliphate, defaced the website, and put up a uh, sign saying that this was the cyber caliphate, Je suis ISIS. Um, so it got a lot of attention. Everybody was reporting that it was going on. Um, and... Uh, very effectively. But wait a second. <laughs> now it turns out that that particular attack uh, was not, it bore all the hallmarks of some Russian hackers, ones associated with APT28 or Fancy Bear. Um, now, I got to warn you, I, 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 I was doubting whether I should put up a post by John Schindler. Um, if you read his stuff, he is, you know, former NSA counterintelligence operative, and to him, everything is a uh, is a Russian attack. So if if you actually read this article, keep in mind that all of his other claims doesn't mean the cyber caliphate is fancy bear, uh, but this one particular case, uh, we've got pretty good evidence that it truly was. So this is a false flag attack. This is uh, Russian hacktivists or those, if it's APT-28, then they're really associated with the GRU. Uh, APT-28, Fancy Bear by another name, is, uh, has, has been shown to be you know, part of the GRU, which is the Russian Military Intelligence Service. So this one attack, false flag, other attackers using the cyber caliphate as cover basically for their activities. And, you know, so this harps back to last week's session. Uh, the purpose is pretty transparent here. It's to 
cause uh, division uh, and you know, get people upset at each other. So moving right along, the one of the uh, more effective uses of the internet by uh, terrorist organizations is in recruiting, and in particular the uh, ISIS. So we're going to, you know, drill in a little bit of that uh, because ISIS is engaged in jihad in uh, in the Middle East. They're actively recruiting, and so far, you know, the reports are that uh, over. 10,000 people have uh, decided to join forces with this movement and have traveled from their home countries uh, um, to Iraq to join in these battles. So I'm going to try a uh, little translation uh, here. We, we, we practice this, folks, uh, <laughs> before, the, before the webinar. So we'll see how we go. Don't worry. So... Uh, listen carefully. Uh, so the audio is going through my computer and coming back to you. Um, so this uh, is a Washington Post uh, video where they collected a, a um, recruiting video. So this is the type of thing that ISIS, ISIL, Daesh is using to recruit these uh, Europeans and South Americans, you know, from anywhere in the world using it to recruit them to join forces with them. And there's you know, many others. This isn't, I find this video very upsetting, but it's, uh, I'm not gonna show you any beheadings, um, and nothing violent, just the language that they use is violent. So let's see if you can hear it. There's no sound yet. As many as one in six Europeans joining the Islamic State. All my brothers living in the West, I know how you feel when I used to live there. In the heart, you feel depressed. The cure for the depression is jihad fi sabirillah. You feel like you have no honor, sir. The honor of a believer is qiyamul lay. Eh? The honor of the ummah is jihad fi sabirillah. All my brothers, come to jihad and feel the honor we are feeling. Feel the honor. As you can see, this is under our feet right now. As Abu Bakr al-Baghdad used to say, he's the breaker of barriers. Inshallah, we'll break the barrier of Iraq, Jordan, Lebanon, all the countries, inshallah. Until we reach Quds, inshallah. It's the first barriers of many barriers we'll bring, inshallah. No, this, that is it's not just one American. It is not just one European that is here. Know that we are many. And we are many in numbers and we will take your lives. And have you forgotten that we took, your, we took your tanks and your Humvees with only IEDs and RPGs? Have you forgotten this? And know that the ground that we sit on is the ground that we will bury you in. That was it. So, effective, pretty effective recruiting propaganda, if you must admit. These look like Great guys, you want to join them. Um, can you still hear me now, Guy? Yep, you sound great, um, but yeah, we can just see your whole desktop now. All right. So, so that level of, of um, you know, video can be very convincing. You can imagine the effectiveness of it. And there's lots and lots of videos like this on, uh, on YouTube and other sharing platforms. So let's talk about social media. This is the part where I think uh, we're actually getting better. I think we actually know what we're doing about that. Um, so uh, this is uh, a book called ISIS, The State of Terror, Jessica Stern and J.M. Berger. Uh, and they claim that as part of its quest to terrorize the world, ISIS has mastered an arena no terrorist group had conquered before the burgeoning world of social media. And you remember the posts of beheadings and other gruesome shots that occurred. I find it uh, ironic too that uh, social media has been turned against uh, some of these uh, militants by because when they post pictures, they're revealing the background and revealing their locations. And that has uh, spelled their doom in many cases. Now, since uh, 
August of 2015 to uh, just a couple months ago, Twitter has identified 935,000, almost a million accounts as, you know, I don't know if they're belonging to terrorists, but being associated with terrorism, and they suspend those accounts. Um, the Somebody, I'm sure, is going to tell me that the account, I've got a picture of sitting there, uh, Al Almanara News, is not associated with terrorism. I don't know. I found an article that said it was, um, but it's a the news organi organization for Hezbollah, and it's still there. So t even Twitter doesn't think um, it's associated with terrorism. Be that as it may, it's hard to find shots of those accounts. <laughs> um, so let's talk about, because there are so few examples of true cyber terrorists, um, we have to talk about uh, the most commonly cited example and the best example, and that is a hacker turned terrorist. Uh, so Junaid Hussein uh, lived in Birmingham in the UK, and he was first he was a hacker. Uh, he was tricked from Team Poison, uh, and then he uh, um, was recruited uh, into Jihad. Uh, used the name Abu Hassan al-Bertani, uh, and, and he was actually responsible for that uh, list of 8,000 uh, targeted uh, U.S. military personnel and called on people to, uh, to you know, kill them. And he also uh, was being retweeted by a couple of terrorists who did engage in uh, an act of terror uh, right before they they went off and did their thing, so there was very very strong associations between him and and uh, ISIS. So uh, and he also hacked uh, Tony Blair's email uh, and leaked the emails as well. So an effective hacker uh, uh, joined a terrorist group, makes him a cyber uh, terrorist. And uh, but he fell to a uh, technological attack. Supposedly, uh, some contractors for GCHQ uh, got him to click on a link in the SureSpot app that he was using for secure communication. Uh, the the link grabbed his GPS coordinates, and there were two attempts uh, to uh, kill him by drone fire. And the second attempt in August of 2015 was successful and killed two of his bodyguards. Um, to be fair, we not fair, but uh, we have to mention that the first attempt killed innocent civilians. So a lot of force to kill a, uh, a hacker. Uh, but certainly the story made the rounds in the hacker community because doesn't happen very often. Not since the uh, the uh, Eastern European spammer was found bludgeoned to death uh, by a baseball bat because people hated spam so much. There's some other effective responses uh, using technology, and this was pretty interesting. So we know that uh, YouTube is a, a site for um, a, a lot of these recruiting videos. You've probably all seen videos of, of uh, various activities going on, people firing on ships, pirates firing on ships uh, um, uh, that, that serve to uh, promote the efforts of terrorist organizations. So this was published just in July, and YouTube says that a, the month prior, they had mentioned the four steps they're taking to combat terrorist content on YouTube. Um, and one of those areas is to, is to focus on countering online violent extremism. So starting in July, if you searched for these types of videos, you would be essentially redirected or you'd be fed suggestions of videos that would, how to say it, would tend to lead you away from being recruited into jihadism. Uh, so, you know, we've really stepped over a, a line here as far as freedom of speech, etc. So I went and tested it. Um, so I typed in ISIS, 4.2 million results. Sure enough, if you look closely at each of these videos, they are not 
recruiting videos. They would not encourage you to become a, uh, a terrorist in any way. Um, and they're critical of, of ISIS. So yes, YouTube is trying to influence the world through the results it feeds you using a pretty clever algorithm because, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of good content there. So um, I'm going to wrap up with this question and then we'll take q and I'm sure we've got lots of those, Guy. Um, if we started worrying about cyber terrorism in 1998 and everybody in the IT world is seems totally aware, myself included, how easy it is to engage in disruptive attacks on the internet. Um, so <clears throat> some of the things we know are completely doable and still doable, even though we've had the example of uh, Ukraine two years ago, is uh, attackers can disable power grids. Now, we didn't get into this in the, on the cyber, well, we, we did talk about it when we were talking about the um, early definitions of cyber warfare is um, why don't they engage in disabling power grids? How come we don't have any, uh, other than Ukraine, concrete examples of hackers taking down power grids? Uh, you know, if everybody's fighting with each other, why are they waiting? And certainly that holds uh, doubly true for terrorist organizations. You know, if, if all the seem to want by any of their violent activities is to cause disruption and hurt their adversaries, you know, and in the United States and uh, gets a lot of that ire, um, you know, for many, many reasons. Uh, why doesn't a hacker group take down the power grid in the United States? It would be devastating. There'd be loss of life. Uh, people um, are, are in hospitals or confined to their beds in, uh, in their homes. It would be a horrible, horrible thing. Um, and how, how about shutting down first responders' communications during a physical attack? You know, so after a car bombing or an IED of some sort, um, why not interfere with the first responders, police, uh, emergency vehicles, uh, instructions. So there's chaos, even more chaos than they created in the first place. Uh, similar to disabling traffic lights, same thing. What about a Tom Clancy favorite shutting down Wall Street? You could really hurt the West by uh, causing a, a major failure of trading on Wall Street. Uh, apparently doesn't happen. Or, you know, in the more extreme cases, some of the early writers uh, recognize the vulnerabilities of uh, nuclear power plants. Uh, so call, you know, cause a uh, core meltdown in a nuclear power plant. Or my favorite example and the one that constantly perplexes me is if you really wanted to cause a disruptive attack, why don't you take down the Internet? It's easy. Um, and the best example that demonstrates how easy it is, though there are many examples of the internet failing, um, was in, I, I want to say, 2014. Um, you, you might recall there was some issues going on in Pakistan between the uh, uh, Supreme Court and the leader of Pakistan. Um, it, but besides that, he decreed that you know, YouTube would no longer be visible or watchable in Pakistan. Uh, and the reason was people had posted videos of, of uh, the judges talking in this court case. Um, but the, the reason he gave was the YouTube has all these horrible uh, things that were inappropriate on it. So all the ISPs uh, were commanded to not allow anybody in Pakistan to see YouTube videos. So at one of the uh, ISPs, the engineer had a clever idea of how to do that um, because you could just, you know, uh, redirect the actual uh, web visits to your own web page or something like that. No, he decided to use uh, BGP, which is the Border Gateway Protocol. And it's the protocol that every router on the Internet uses to, uh, to basically communicate what routes it handles and, and therefore it can negotiate the wonderful thing that the internet is. You can route around outages with this capability. Um, but for the most part, people accept the routes from their downstream 
or upstream routers and broadcast them downstream. The, the algorithm that a backbone router uses to determine who's the authoritative announcer for a particular uh, uh, grouping of IP addresses, a block of IP addresses, is the one that's more granular is the authoritative one. And you, it's got to work that way, right? So um, uh, Verizon or O2 or somebody is a backbone provider. They've got a big, huge block of IP addresses. But when you sign up as a customer, they give you a small block of IP addresses and they rely on you and your routers to tell them what domain names your or IP addresses you're resolving. So if they get traffic for you, they know to send it to you. So when this uh, system administrator in Pakistan announced that just a small segment, just the YouTube IP addresses that were actually alive at the time <clears throat> were routed to a Bitbucket, a null address on their network, the upstream provider in Hong Kong picked up those uh, routing uh, tables and broadcast them to the entire world. For two or three hours, all of the uh, all of YouTube was unavailable. So they took down YouTube, which is a pretty big deal. It'd be a very big deal today if that happened. Um, and because the total bandwidth available to Pakistan from uh, from Hong Kong was only 45 megabits, everybody who tried to see a YouTube video was routed to Pakistan. They uh, incurred a denial of service attack on the entire country. So Pakistan was no longer on the internet. So, so it leaves me with this final question and uh, hopefully we'll be discussing this week is why not? What's holding you back if, if cyber terrorism is the power? Start off with one from Bato Given. Sorry if I've said that wrong. Uh, What's your view on Microsoft call for a, a digital Geneva convention? Um, we were talking earlier about, you know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, nice thought. And I, I certainly support um, all attempts to create norms. Um, you know, the trouble is it's a little early to think that um, the internet is, as a whole is going to fall into um, a common way of behavior. It's still in many, many ways, uh, you know, free and open. We're battling that every day and, and countries around the world are putting up barriers to that free and open. And obviously you've got the two cases of China and Russia, um, but then you've got all of the EU creating uh, privacy regulations that are stronger than the rest of the world. Uh, that's going to force, co you know, companies and organizations in the rest of the world to question whether or not they want customers in the EU at all, because they can't comply with the stringent uh, data privacy regulations. So I think it, I think it's good to have a forum. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, Microsoft is the right one to, to pull that together. There are other uh, groups associated with the United Nations and the EU that are attempting to do that as well. There's a, I went to the, so there's been a series of events, the, uh, uh, what do they call them? The International Cyber Summits, I, I want to say. First one was in the UK. Um, I went to the second one in uh, Budapest. Uh, I think they had one in South Korea, I want to say. Um, and it was all these policymakers, wonks, uh, getting together and talking about these questions. But at the one I was in, there was the, uh, the big elephant in the room was everybody's talking about the norms they want to create and how we should all work together. And nobody wanted to talk about the fact that uh, China and Russia would not sign up to the European Commission's uh, Treaty on Cybercrime. Uh, so this treaty's been there now for uh, 15 years, and uh, there's 49 signatory countries, I believe, uh, and it basically allows law enforcement to work with each other to track down these cases because because cybercrime was was the first big issue that had to be cross jurisdictional, uh, and this is the way it should be now. The elephant in the room was that parties like uh, China and Russia felt that that was an incursion on their sovereignty. 
In other words, they have rights to rule the internet inside their physical domain. So until we address that head on, um, it's going to be difficult to get these common norms in place. Though, you know, don't forget the internet has norms of its own. Uh, probably you know, you've got anonymous um, with what they promulgate. You've got the whole concept of the Pirate Bay information should be free. Uh, and these, you know, these groups represent very, very strong feelings of the netizens, uh, especially the early ones who thought that they had created something wonderful with the internet. Or something that, as Robert said in the chat, you know, uh, something that uh, resembles a horse that has bolted, <laughs> something that might be too difficult to, to, to create a code or a norm for. Um, we've got some questions from Mark B. He's asked, uh, should, there be, should there be harsh penalties for those that use cyber tools or warf warfare? Um, I might think of trick again. Um, um, or should be, we perhaps infiltrate and compromise the tools that they use in order to defend and also attack with them? And who we are uh, yeah. is, a, yeah. is a question, yeah. is an interesting question. Yeah. Well, um, I'm sure everybody here has a problem with a nation state trying and condemning somebody in absentia and then assassinating them regardless, right? It's a very, very uh, difficult subject. And if you uh, invoke laws of armed conflict uh, and say it's self-defense, as Tony Blair did in the case of uh, uh, Jamal, um, you stepped over a line. And so I think there, you know, certainly if you can bring somebody to justice and try them with uh, the things they've done, then, you know, in, in each jurisdiction, there's going to be different uh, penalties for the types of things they do. But, you know, in the United States, calling for jihad isn't a crime. That's free speech. Uh, recruiting a, somebody for a terrorist activity is. So which have you done? Now, there is plenty of evidence for this being a one-sided battle, and the cyber terrorists are losing it. They're horrible at it. Uh, and it goes all, all the way back to, uh, you know, Shane Harris wrote a good book. Uh, uh, um, it's called At War, so At Sign War. And uh, uh, it's basically the war in Iraq uh, during the surge. And it explains that the so-called surge wasn't effective because there were more troops sent to Iraq. It was because the NSA went in and started working uh, embedded with the, uh, the soldiers uh, it, to do a better job of tracking the use of cell phones. And of course, the infrastructure that had been built in Iraq under Saddam Hussein was, was you know, all done by uh, Western telecom companies. So they were very quickly able to commandeer all the cell phone traffic, target, you know, listen in on conversations, uh, target the uh, people planning a, an attack on a convoy or something. And then uh, after they had uh, you know, fired their uh, weapons from, uh, from Raptors, they would go in and collect all the devices and see if they were still good. And then they'd you know, do the forensics analysis on those devices. So, you know, the technology, of course, is uh, somebody, somebody just, the other day said, uh, you know, ISIS is biggest vulnerability, don't you? And I said, well, of course. They keep posting pictures to, to Twitter of where they are. Uh, so you can't do the, the uh, media outreach that they're effectively trying to accomplish uh, without giving away their locations. So the, there's a bit of a, uh, uh, I guess, ladder that everyone's climbing, right? Because right after um, the uh, uh, cell phone, of Jamal was used in order to target him, the communications dropped dr dramatically. You know, terrorists and jihadists and insurgents learn not to use cell phones. Um, they have to fall back on other means of communications. And it won't be, you know, but there are effective means of communications that so far can't be tapped into. Um, 
and just a matter of time before we see that uh, terrorists are, are using those communications too. But it's, I'm trying not to use the word arms race here, but it's an escalation, continuous escalation in uh, technology use. Interesting question here from Mali um, with respect to Australia, given the overwhelming majority of our students are from Australia. Could Australia ever punch above its weight in the realm of offensive and defensive cyber capability? And if so, what kind of policies would achieve this? Maybe slightly tangential, but, but uh, yeah. interesting question. No, great question. Um, I truly believe that that is possible. Um, I've, you know, if you look at the level of investment required to get to that level where you're punching above your weight, um, it's a lot less than building two more aircraft carriers or, or creating a nuclear powered submarine force. Or buying uh, a bunch of F-35s. Or buying a bunch of F-35s, which are going to be outdated by the time you receive them. And uh, if you read my book or come next week, you'll hear me talk about the vulnerabilities in the F-35. Um, so I think for sure there's an opportunity for, you know, uh, the mouse that roared, um, you know, a small country to become uh, a leader in cyber defense and offense capabilities. And, you know, if it's justified that they do that, you know, you, you don't want to see an African nation squander its uh, treasure on investments that aren't in the best interest of its populace. But what about a, uh, an Australia or a South Korea uh, or a Japan, um, you know, upping their game and not being the victims of uh, cyber espionage as much as they are and being, you know, welcomed into the fold of uh, the five eyes if you're on the outside or having something to exchange to the NSA if you're a member of the five eyes as is Australia. So you're not just taking orders from them. You're, you've got something to bargain with in, in, uh, in exchange. So, yeah, I, but it's a great question, and I think the answer is yes. I guess the next question would be, would it be worth it, uh, and what would the the risks be if you do do it? But that's, I guess, a, an argument for another time. No, but uh, it's a good question because, yes, it's worth it, because look at what happened in Israel where they, they had to uh, create the Unit 8200, right, in order to engage in espionage and cyber offensive activities. Um, but they cycle all of the, uh, uh, you know, all their young people that go through it only spend three years there. They all came out and created all the security companies that we have today. Oh, yeah, but the, I guess there's other considerations with respect to, yeah, um, whether it's just a financial thing or, or, yeah, or yeah. you know, like the, I guess the equal and opposite reaction sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Kingsley has asked, um, back on, I guess, the, the conventions and norms of, of the internet. Um, could internet neutrality in any way put some sort of control on cyber terrorism? If yes, how? Um, I, I guess at first blush, it'd be, no, it'd be the opposite, right? Because internet uh, neutrality is, is supposed to be, um, uh, you know, no, no ability for a carrier or somebody to filter things based on, on uh, traffic type and of course net neutrality is uh you know it's a u.s thing right it's you know which is one of the one of its problems right what does it matter what the u.s says it's not going to affect the internet because the internet's bigger than the u.s a lot bigger okay uh jacob has asked uh what are your thoughts on blockchain stopping ddos Blockchain stopping DDoS. Um, that might be a question that I've <laughs> not got much awareness of. So, <laughs> um, it, certainly, blockchain's got infinite possibilities for uh, instances where you need transparency and security. And uh, some of the examples I've seen people bringing forward. You know, for instance, for identity and access management, it's overkill. You don't need all that. We already have perfectly good ways to uh, to accomplish that. So just as encryption, you know, you, in blockchain doesn't actually encrypt something for you; it just 
records a hash of something you've done. Um, so I don't see a, I, I would turn it around. I would see the risk being to DDoSing uh, used as a tool in the mining wars. Uh, so if, you know, if you could somehow DDoS the, uh, a miner that was getting ready to uh, earn the next coin, um, you could slow them down in such a way that you got to earn the next coin. So I could see future uh, cyber wars erupting between uh, Bitcoin miners or Ethereum or whoever's, whoever's engaged in it. Uh, okay, and Rich has sent in a comment and question saying that Jacob is talking about a comic strip joke. So there you go. <laughs> uh, no, probably XKCD and I missed it. <laughs> yes. Uh, I, I quite often feel like I've missed something. <laughs> uh, we might just end with a quick question from Stuart. Uh, what are your thoughts on responding to cyber terrorism with kinetic attacks? If you, if you don't agree with it, how do you balance the impact of cyber terrorism from standard terrorism? Um, I think the uh, Talon manual and the US military's doctrine and the law of armed uh, conflict allows kinetic attack against uh, somebody who's engaged in a cyber attack. Um, so, for instance, if, you know, somebody took down the communication network in a country or the power grid, if you could identify who did it, um, even not taking into account uh, whether they claim to have done it or not, um, then, you know, all those things, Tal Manual, et cetera, would uh, view those as acts of war, and therefore you can retaliate with physical force. Um, but, you know, targeting individuals based on uh, uh, not a uh, uh, judicial process, I've, I definitely have issues with that. Okay, well, we'll try and wrap it up within one lunch break for once. Uh, <laughs> Yay. Uh, mine and America, well done, Richard. Um, All right. So, yeah, just I just have to say thank you to everyone for a lot of respectful and I guess uh, robust debate in the chat uh, for sending some really interesting questions in. If we didn't get to them, it's really not a reflection on the quality of the question. Feel free to send that to the forums as well. And we'll, we'll discuss that as well. I was saying to Richard before the webinar, we've had 4,000 individual engagements with last week's uh, forum discussion alone. Um, so it's been a really fantastic effort and you guys should be really happy with what you've come up with and, and the way you've collaborated with us and, and made this course so much better. Um, other than that, what, what's up next week, Richard? Yeah. So next week uh, we're, we're going to get probably less controversial because we're going to talk about the military's adaption of uh, cyber. Um, and we're going to focus a lot on why they need to, because of the vulnerabilities that they've built into the component systems of something called network centric warfare, which is, was the big move uh, starting in the 1990s. So we're going to go back to uh, uh, pure cyber warfare discussion. Great. Looking forward to that. And that one's at midday on Tuesday, Australian Eastern Daylight Time as always. So uh, uh, until then, thanks very much. Enjoy your, your discussion forums. <laughs> um, I'll put the discussion prompts up right now, but thanks Richard. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone.